can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Josh Basira of Augurian. And before I formally introduce you, Josh, I always like to point out other episodes of the podcast. Since this is a part of the top agency series, you can check out um, some of the other ones. Uh, Jason Swank on the podcast, where he talked about building his agency up to over eight figures and selling it. And now they're acquiring agencies. Um, and what they do to evaluate that uh, the agency they're they're purchasing. I had Ian Garlic on, who specializes in video case stories and how do you best tell your customer stories. And uh, Duncan Alney, who works with food and beverage brands, and um, check those out. They all share great advice. And this episode is brought to you by Rise Twenty Five, and at Rise Twenty Five, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream One Hundred relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We are an easy button for a company to launch and run your podcast. We do strategy, accountability, and full execution uh, around the podcast. So for me, Josh, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And personally, I found no better way over the past over decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with everyone else what they're working on. And I know Josh has a podcast as well, so we'll talk about that. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com. Both my business partner and I have been doing it for over a decade. So um, we'll feel free to answer anything that you have that you throw our way. And I'm excited to introduce Josh Baseri. He's 15 plus years of experience in digital marketing. He is an advocate for connecting digital marketing to a business's bottom line and prioritizing learning over metrics. And Josh is a founding partner and president of Algerian, like I mentioned, which is a boutique digital marketing agency located in the great city of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Josh, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. I got the uh, Minneapolis right behind me. And uh, for people who want to check out their website, it's A-U-G-U-R-I-A-N.com. So just start off, Josh, with a Tell people a little bit about your company and what you do. Sure, no problem. Well, first of all, I appreciate you having me on as a guest. Uh, Hearing that you've been doing podcasts for 10 years, I think I'm in like my 30th episode is like, wow, inspirational. So uh, yeah, so Agurian is, like you said, a boutique digital marketing agency. Um, We aren't a full service agency. We've made a strategic decision to focus on kind of four key areas. The first of those is paid media. So that's like Google ads and all the paid social platforms. And we do all of all of that management for clients. The second thing is uh, search engine optimization. So SEO. Uh, Third thing is content marketing. And we can get into like how we think about the customer journey uh, later on. And then the last thing is analytics. So what we don't do is we don't build websites. We don't do like email nurturing workflows. We aren't a creative agency. Don't come to us and ask us to build your brand or like, you know, design a new logo or anything like that. Um, we are definitely data wonks and love digging into data, understanding what's working and what isn't for our clients and learning from that. Josh, sometimes it takes discipline to say no, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm sure you have clients who are like, hey, can you do this website? Hey, can you do this email? What out of those services you don't do was the toughest for you to stay disciplined on and saying, no, we are sticking to these things and we're not adding something else? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, So probably website development. Uh, You know, website development is something that's that's challenging and many times because our teams need the website to be performing well in order for like if we're driving, we're paying money using Google ads to drive traffic to a website, that experience, you know, is also part of whether or not that person is going to convert on the page, right? And so we've had numerous kind of over the years discussions about like, well, should we get into this or should we not get into this or whatever? And, uh, And I think, you know, 
to date, we're still not uh, we're not on board with building out a whole bunch of uh, web devs and trying to do that for our customers. It's just um, it's like a very kind of subjective, very uh, kind of artistic in a lot of ways. It can be very artistic and just we're just focused on like numbers. Yeah, it's a slippery slope, but I totally yeah. see the next thing is like, well, we're going to be driving a ton of traffic to this. Can you make these tweaks because we feel that will increase your conversions, right? And so typically now you give them, you give them like a feature set, like we want to make sure, can this do whoever does this and have them make those changes? Yeah, it, it really depends on the client, right? But uh, there's clients who have in-house teams and we are benefit from that. So we can say, hey, we want to run like a A-B test on this. Can you stand up a page with these? Um, there's other clients who are allow us to make changes um, in the sense that like there's products like Google Optimize where you can actually run A-B tests and you don't need a web dev. So our team is very fluent and experienced and doing some of the like conversion rate optimization is for sure a thing that we do. And so we need to figure out our workarounds to be able to uh, do run some of those A/B tests, but um, not building not building full websites, not uh, not not a single web dev on the team. Talk about you know I know you are big into leadership and leading teams. What are some of the things that you really do with the team that helps them thrive? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think you know. I'm a big believer in kind of the Simon Sinek start with why. So, you know, we have our our why, our how, and our what very clearly defined. And we talk about that. And um, we have our set of eight core values, which is a lot. Um, but, you know, it's, it's fun to kind of see the team rallying around that, buying in and embracing those, those like major kind of cultural cornerstones of, of what we're trying to build here. So an example of that is like in our Slack channel, we have we have a kudos Slack channel. And anytime somebody like wants to give a kudos to a teammate for helping them out or something like that, you're going to see like hashtag kudos to so-and-so for helping me out with this thing that I needed to get done really quickly. And they did an awesome job. And then it's like hashtag honor teamwork, right? So they they're Every time a kudos comes out, it's uh, pended with some sort of a hashtag around one of our core values. So I feel like, you know, part of leadership is not only having those foundational things in place, but actually getting them to kind of live, uh, live and breathe within the within the day to day. When people on your team think of your core values, is there a one that sticks out to most people first? <laughs> um we've had like so we do a, like a monday meeting right and uh and we'll let people share some like a highlight of their weekend and then we will have some piece of business that we get into and we do like a kudos session well one of the kind of pieces of business we once did is broke the team up into groups and had them go and like talk about what's your favorite core value and why um so we we do that kind of activity to also try to embed a little more of that um, and we had them like write it down on a shared Google sheet so everybody else could see it and kind of the why, um, man, it's, it's like all over the board. What's something that you remember from that? What someone wrote their favorite core value and why? Um, so there was a lot of balance work life. So that's a, that's a core value of ours. Um, work smarter, not better is kind of the the tagline to that one. And I think, you know, we have people who have come from other agencies um, where they're like really burning their people out or grinding them really hard. And, um, you know, we, since COVID, have had a highly hybrid workplace. People can basically work from wherever they want, whenever they want, as long as the work is kind of getting done and they're available to their teammates and clients when they need to be. Um, and so, uh, we see like the work-life balance and kind of that hybrid workplace and giving people a little bit more of that autonomy is like a huge piece of our employment value proposition beyond just like what your compensation is and all those things. 
So that one uh, is one that comes to mind for sure uh, when I, when thinking about that list. Which is yours, your favorite? Well, I'll say have fun. That's that that's uh that's uh for sure for sure a favorite because I just feel like uh, if if you're not having fun, then why are you doing it, right? Um, but I mean, I helped write them all, so I love them all. Um, but yeah, <laughs> choosing fun, your best child, is, I get it. Have fun is a great one. Talk about baseball. Okay. Yeah, I mentioned this to you uh, prior to us like recording. So we do something called baseball at Agurian. Uh, and basically what it is, is our teams um, share wins that they're having with their clients and on their client accounts with one another. Uh, so someone will get up and they'll prepare kind of an at bat and say, okay, here's what I did. Here's the win that I had. Here's the impact that it had on the client, either from like a revenue perspective or a conversions perspective or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then their team, the the other people on the team who are listening to their at bat, they all vote. Was that a single, double, triple or a home run? Right. And then we keep score and at the end we have a couple of seasons every year and at the end of the season we know who has hit, who has hit the most home runs and then they're like our baseball winner and so we actually have jerseys that say like agurian on the front and numbers on the back and we we've, we've got kind of made it fun um and i know that the team loves playing baseball because a, it's it's fun we've kind of gamified work uh in a way but also because it gives them an opportunity to like hear what their colleagues are doing. It gives them ideas like, oh, I'd never thought of doing that with a client. I'm going to try that with my client over here, right? So it's just a great way to like share knowledge, to let them help each other level up, to have a little bit of fun, right? Um, and, you know, we are, we're digital marketers, so we're competitive. So, you know, people want to, people want to win baseball. It's great for morale too because you're sharing all the wins. Yeah, yeah. We we actually this year because of the success of baseball, we stood up a whole page on our website that's just called wins, where anybody who's presenting an at bat, we take the gist of that and it's now published on our website and it's linked to their name. And so, like now, even every person's profile on our website has like the wins that they've presented. So you know we're embracing it. Um, and I think the team loves it. Josh, I love that. What else do you do under the fun category for team building? So you obviously have the Slack channel, you have baseball. What else do you incorporate? So I mentioned the kudos on Monday morning meetings um, and just Monday morning meetings in general, I think are good. It's just because we are so hybrid, it's just, it's, and it's just a way for people to like connect to one another and hear about stuff that you're doing on the weekend. That's not work. Right. So um, that's fun. The kudos session on our Mondays meetings are just great. It's where you just, people say, I have kudos to give and they get an opportunity to say who their kudos is for and why. And normally like we probably have 20 to 30 different kudos and everybody just kind of leaves that meeting feeling great and getting ready to start the, start the week. So um, love the kudos session. Um, and then other things that we do is we're uh, big on uh, volunteerism. So at least quarterly, we're doing some sort of a volunteer activity. Uh, let's see, Q4 of last year, we went um, we went to Target as a team and we bought a ton of gifts, brought them back here, wrapped them and then delivered them to a a, a place that will then distribute them to families who um, would love to have some extra gifts under their trees. Uh, so that was a, a thing that we did uh, this last month, I think late January, we went to Second Harvest Heartland, which is like a, you know, food, it's helps with food insecurity. And we packed some like potatoes and stuff as a team. So those types of like team building things are super fun. Of course, we'll do an occasional happy hour together and things like that. We'll or ordering lunch on occasion and people actually come to the office and eat uh, versus just being hybrid or a uh, remote. Um, and then uh, we also just do fun events. Just yesterday, we went to an indoor uh, mini golf, mini golf place and, and arcade as a team. And we just 
took a couple hours out of our day and did some mini golfing and played some video games together. So um, those are some of the things that we did. What did um, life look like pre-COVID versus post-COVID for the agency? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say like pre-COVID, 80% of the people, 90% of the people were in office uh, four days a week, even though we had some, you know, like it wasn't against the rules by any means to work from home, but there was just like, uh, I don't know, inertia or like kind of the momentum in the office was, hey, like everybody's in the office. And that has been probably the biggest shift. And I'll be honest, as like a kind of the guy with a little bit of gray in his beard, I'm like, hey, I, I love seeing people. I love like the water cooler talk um, that comes with being in the office. But I'm uh, more and more convinced that like the value proposition of people being able to kind of not have to commute for 30 minutes each way and like being able to eat lunch or like you know, take their dog out or, you know, the flexibility. Run an yeah, yeah, there's, it's just, it's so much more valuable to people. So uh, I'm, I'm letting go of that rope. And, uh, and I think, I think the, the team likes it better. So that, that's probably like the biggest shift, I would say. And like client stuff, like rarely are, do we have an in person client meeting ever or in person sales meeting. Like I just, all the selling is done through Zoom or, you know, Google Meet or whatever. Um, it's just incredible to me. So anyway. What was it like before? Because you had a lot of local Minnesota businesses. Yeah. And we're still, we're still, uh, I would say like 80% of our business is local. Um, so yeah, it's, it would be like, hey, come over to our offices. We're kind of like the wine and dine, like let's meet in person and use a whiteboard and man, it's just, we've gone very far away from that. And I don't miss it, like necessarily. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Um, You know, one thing is you talked about the niches, you know, the the services, and you don't do certain things. Mm -hmm. Uh, I love to talk about the niches. You serve, you know, when I research B2B, you have higher education, you have manufacturing, you have real estate, tech. Um, Are there any industries you're like, you know, this is really not our sweet spot? Not really. So like, that's another thing that I've kind of uh, am really grateful for is that we decided not to like totally niche out uh, and just provide services. Like I, I know somebody who's their agency was all around like trade shows and man, did their business dry up over COVID. Right. And so I, I've felt like the decision to, um, to not like niche down to like only we're only doing B2B or we're only doing e-commerce or whatever um, is a good one for us anyway. Uh, What it also allows is like when I'm talking about teams sharing, uh, you know, wins and ideas and experiences with, with uh, campaigns and things with clients is it gives an opportunity for like someone to be talking about like this very effective strategy for, from an e-commerce perspective. But then the person listening to them who's managing kind of more of a B2C services, maybe it is higher ed where we're, we're not, you know, nobody's putting an MBA in a shopping cart and buying it. But yes, it is a, you know, B2C transaction. It's just longer sales cycles, different. But they can like, you can actually learn stuff from uh, having this diversity of clientele. And so, uh, you know, we like software as a service. We really like Uh, We like it because, you know, many times those companies are high growth. Uh, They get what we're doing. They're very tech enabled. They understand kind of the the digital marketing side of things. So there's a huge learning curve. A lot of times they've got bigger budgets and they're ready to go. And you can, the attribution is very, very simple. It's like, did somebody sign up for the the demo or the free trial, right? It's all online and it's really easy to do. Um, but we also love B2B manufacturing, long sales cycles, high dollar, like lifetime value where you sell one deal and it's worth like $10 million. Like those, those are fun things to work on as well. I want to talk about, I really like how you have this framework for content marketing. 
And so okay. I'm actually going to pull it up here so we can take a look at it while we talk about it. But I'd love to have you walk through um, Agreeance framework. Sure. So um, I've always thought that our content marketing is somewhat of like a kissing cousin to SEO, right? So basically, <laughs> what I mean by that is it's still very much powered by the same uh, principles that you would think about for SEO. So we uh, talk about our customer journey and kind of these six different phases that you see here, right? Unaware, problem aware, solution aware, solution compare, purchase, and and then success or loyalty, which is post purchase. Um, let's just talk about those the first five. Um, but really, what we're trying to do with our uh, customer journey is help our clients understand what are the topics and questions related to uh, you know our customers business that consumers or people are out there searching on they're in at volume right so that more than one person per month is searching on this topic or question there's hundreds of people thousands of people that might be searching on this topic that might be related to you know how do i start a effective podcast right in in your case maybe so there's uh, what we do is we try to say, okay, what are all the topics and questions? Let's put those topics and questions into like what stage of the customer journey do they belong in? And then we look and say, all right, do we have content that actually addresses these topics and questions? And how well is our content performing? Like what of the volume of searches, how many of those eyeballs are we actually capturing? And then we look and see, like, what about the competition? Like, who's actually winning on these topics and questions? How many eyeballs are they capturing? And then we prioritize, basically. We look and say, all right, well, we've got a bunch of content that's kind of high funnel, unaware, problem aware, um, that's performing pretty good. But we really don't have any content in, like, the solution compare stage. And so then our team will basically take all of this information, the competitor information, our own kind of audit information, the topics and questions and prioritize and say, okay, this is the topic that we should write about first and here's why. Um, and then we just, we generate a prioritized list of topics and then we just start writing on them. So that's the process in a nutshell. What are some, I, I mean, I'm sure you see a lot of companies that come to you and they're in all different stages of having some of this, all of it or none of it. What yeah. are some of the big mistakes that you see companies making when they first meet with you um, in their their content marketing in this customer journey? You know, I think a lot of times uh, when people think about digital marketing, they are really like focused on number five, like the bottom of the funnel, like somebody is actually typing in. I need a digital marketing agency in Minneapolis near me or in Minneapolis. Like that is like very much, I already am aware that digital marketing exists. I'm aware that there's agencies that deliver those services. I'm probably even aware of the co competitor set. And now I'm just looking for someone near me, right? So I think that like the biggest mistake is like this propensity to like focus so much on the bottom of the funnel where Yes, there's there's that's where you extract the value, right? At the end of the day. But my belief is that the the companies that move up funnel and are seen as the companies that are doing like the education of that prospect all throughout the customer journey, like the the sooner that we can get into the consideration set of someone as they move through this customer journey, the better, in my opinion. So that when they do get to solution compare, you're already in the consideration set. So that when you do get to purchase, you're already in that set. So anyway, um, I would say that like the biggest mistake is not giving enough credit to some of those like earlier stage, higher funnel um, stages. I imagine it's probably because it's just easier, right? I mean, the the purchase piece to create content and information for the unaware person is just much harder because then you have to fill in all the other stages right i think that's true and i also think there's like a, a data um layer that people you know 
So, you know, you talked about how uh, I'm interested in uh, learning as just as important as metrics, right? And I think that uh, in our industry, there's been like such a focus on like driving results and metrics that uh, where it's easy to like collect that in a data layer and have the uh, like the appropriate attribution where you can say like, we took this action and it drove this result and this is the ROI of that. Like that's pretty easy to do low funnel. It's harder to be able to like tell the story about how like this piece of content that's somewhat related to like what we do is actually driving the like qualified traffic that that qualified traffic is a returning visitor on a number of things they maybe have subscribed to our blog or our podcast and then you know a year later 6 months later they've actually converted on our site and are now a marketing qualified lead or a sales qualified lead like that data layer that's necessary to be able to tell that story is hard it's hard to do we help our clients do that but I think that's why people are just like so much more like it's just easier to focus on the the low bottom funnel. Yeah, I mean when I when I look at this, uh, and if you're listening to the audio only, there is a video piece where we kind of see their page and their customer journey. When I look at this, and then the first part of what you do is you do an audit, right? Um, right. And this seems like it'd be really uh, like not so easy. Because you have to kind of collect everything and then kind of put it into these different stages and then see which one is lacking, right? right. So and then, it doesn't and seem easy. The same thing for your competitors, right? So that's that competitive analysis, which is like, okay, now we did that for us. Now we got to do that for our competitors. And when I mean competitors, I don't necessarily always mean like the people that our client thinks are their direct competitors and the name of that person it's also like who's just winning on that search like what is showing up number one in that search like it could be wikipedia and that's your competitor on that search right so anyway um yeah, it's we, not someone's going to win the business but it's someone who's winning the eyeballs right right so then we need to like think sometimes when we see that it's wikipedia we deprioritize that as a topic, because that's a big, that's an uphill battle. Not that it can't be won, but I'm sure that in the grand scheme of things, there's probably other topics that we can prioritize that we can get traction on quicker. And we always like to get, you know, quick wins if we can. So an example of this, like I got a case study. Um, I know we were going to, you were going to ask me about this. So um, there's a, a college that's very specialized on the East Coast, a uh, client of ours. And, um, and like we were doing content, uh, for them, the content was working all right. And we kind of landed on this idea. We, we, we started to understand through this audit, like that, what we needed moving up the funnel and like providing, uh, a blog that talked about like the earning potential of someone and the types of careers that someone would have if they went to this kind of like exclusive, not exclusive, but it was kind of a niche college, right? It's like an environmental education. So it's like, what are the different uh, jobs that you can get with an environmental education degree? What, what can you expect to get paid working in those jobs, right? So this was like, very much high funnel. It wasn't like, hey, come study here, like get a degree with us. It was. It makes people, people think, are, hmm, just maybe I should consider this occupation. So they're totally unaware. Are, yeah. Or people who are like at least considering like, should I go into a career in environmental education? Like, what's the first question you're going to ask is like, well, what jobs do you get? Right. And so we anyway, we built this like amazing piece of evergreen content. It was just long form blog. And it's to this day, the highest performing, like from a traffic standpoint, blog content. And then because of the data layer, we were, we were able to like show like kids who show up at this page, they return and they return to other pages. And, you know, those turn into applications and those applicants, some of them turn into 
registered registrations. And so like that is powerful stuff if you can make it work. You have, uh, like I mentioned before, a really extensive um, base of types of clients. One of them was a custom fireplace manufacturer, right? So what yeah. did you do with them? Yeah, so it's still a client today. Uh, they're, uh, it's pretty amazing. Like they build the coolest fireplaces. Like think of like what Google has in their like office in Colorado, like some $75,000 custom fireplace. Like that's what these, and I've had the privilege of like touring their manufacturing facility. And it's just like, blacksmiths back in the back like hammering on metal like making stuff like it's amazing and they like showed me how they do a patina using acid i mean it's really cool stuff so they have a they have a great product um and they're kind of two different uh customers that they're going after are like very high-end net worth individuals who can afford like a really nice custom fireplace or like designers and architects and people like that, right? So um, when we started with them, they, you know, they had a sales team. It was a lot of like outbound sales. Um, they were doing some digital marketing. My the contact over there, we had a conversation. I what tried to win their business, lost their business. A year later, I called her and she's like, "Yeah, I think I've made a mistake. Let's let's go with you." Why did and, she know, say uh, that? Why did she say she thinks she made a mistake? Because she wasn't getting what she thought she was going to get from the vendor that she chose for that that year um, engagement. And so, yeah, we've been with them now for like four or five years. And, you know, beyond like doing uh, so we're doing paid media, we're doing SEO and we're doing um, content marketing for them. So we're doing a lot like most of our services with them beyond just providing those services. We, we really pushed and like supported her in her efforts to move the company into like a more data uh, centric approach. So we were able to help her get like HubSpot as a um, CRM across the finish line. So then helped with some implementation of that. So now we've got like a great tool that we can understand like where are the people who are coming to the website coming from when they convert, they go into HubSpot and then we can see like, do they actually turn into a paid customer or not? And once with that like um, data layer, we can take all of the people who have become customers and we can import that back into like the platforms like Google ads and say, Hey, we want to find more people who look like these people, not just the people who converted, not just the people who asked for a bid, but the people who actually mm. bought a, a $75,000 fireplace. We want more of those people. And that transformation has like, I mean, they're grown, growing their business tremendously. Um, I went up there and I spent like an hour with their sales team, helping the sales team understand how, in fact, we can take this data out of the back end of their CRM and help improve the quality of the leads. And once a salesperson kind of understands, hey, like if I do my job in the CRM and actually track this appropriately, then my the the marketing people are going to send me higher quality leads that are going to be easier for me to close. Like they're all, all in, right? They're like, I can help you make money. Like you want to make more money? You help me in HubSpot. So um, that was a big win for us. And uh, and yeah, that that is one of my favorite. Yeah. One of my favorite Josh. Things. That's thank you for sharing that. That's gold because first of all. Sale, the last thing a salesperson wants to do, probably anyone, is yeah. enter detailed things into a CRM, right? They just want to be on the phone with someone selling, right? And But I love how you kind of connected the dots for them saying, if you do this, then we can make the system smarter on the front end and give you more and better people on the back end, which allows them to sell more. Yeah, and it's it's proven to be true. 
And I'm I'm pretty sure that they're growing their sales team and um things are things are humming along pretty good. What's um for the the manufacturing? What would be an example of an unaware and then a problem aware piece of content? Um for manufacturing? Yeah, for this one, for the cost the fireplace manufacturer. What would be yeah. an example of okay? totally unaware and then moving into a problem aware just so people can kind of yeah see the process a little bit yeah so you know there's a piece of content that we've done um and we refresh it almost every year because it's like so awesome which is like a trends piece it's like 2023 fireplace trends right um and so that's something that anybody who's thinking about building a house who's like, you know, wants to put in a backyard, whatever, you know, fire pit situation. Like that's something that'd be like, oh, like a trend piece. I'll I'll take yeah. a look at that. And then all of a sudden they're like, man, I didn't know that you could like order a custom built thing. Like, look at these, like, these are amazing. Right. And for people with money or like, they they love amazing things and they want their things to be amazing. So um, so that's probably an example of like some mm. of that higher funnel content. I don't know if it would necessarily fit in the unaware or problem. Yeah, aware. I would say, um, yeah, that's pretty unaware. I mean, it must have been but gangbusters during COVID. We've people... definitely heard of like, you know, like a, a homeowner taking this like a picture out of this, uh, you know, trends thing and showing it to their architect and then the architect calling and being like, Hey, my client gave me this picture that was in your trends thing. And I need to talk to you about doing something like that. So anyway, what would be, yeah, I'm sure during COVID people are like redoing all sorts of things around their yeah, house. But um, there was also like some supply chain. So like there's, while yes, everybody was like, I'm going to invest money in a backyard, you know, whatever. It's like, yeah, I don't have any steel. So, <laughs> so that's a, a whole nother issue. Yeah. Yeah. That's a different podcast. All we got. Um, so what about problem aware in this situation? Problem aware. So the, in this situation, are they looking for, they know they want to change out or want a new fireplace in this situation. Yeah. yeah, that's probably it. Or like they're feeling like, you know, they've got something that's dated or they're they're doing a remodel or or building from scratch or whatever. And it's like, I know I need to find the, like my architect is telling me, find a fireplace that you want to put in here. Right. And so, then I, all right, I got to go find a fireplace. And many people don't know that you can like get stuff completely custom made still to this day. Right. It's not all just floating across the Pacific, you know, and landing on California and then getting shipped to people. So like we still build stuff with our hands in, in the U S of A. Um, and so like, that's, uh, that's something that, people sometimes aren't always aware of. So we got to make them, keep them aware. From a B2B standpoint. So we talked about higher education. We talked about manufacturing. Yep. Um, from a B2B standpoint, you had a um, Digi. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a client that's in, uh, it's like international, um, probably got a multi-billion dollar market cap. So it's a big company. And they sell like Wi-Fi uh, or like cellular like widgets, like the the things that some bus manufacturer is going to say, hey, we need to be competitive in the future. So all of our buses need to be Wi-Fi enabled or we need to be able to track our buses as they circulate throughout the city or we need every single street light because I'm a lighting manufacturer to have like a little chip in it. That's going to tell us when the light is out so that we don't have to drive by. It just tells us, you know, like, so like I want to build a smart light fixture for, you know, roadways 
and I'm in charge of figuring out which whose widget I'm going to put in there to give me that functionality. So they build those widgets. And so there's uh, their solution is like it's all over the place. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, but the thing is, is that they're competing with like T-Mobile or AT&T on like these terms around, you know, like, uh, I don't know, mesh network and like. Uh, you know for like a totally very, different use very technical terms yeah but like yeah they're competing with these huge brands and it's super competitive and that's like very high funnel high funnel content um whereas like you know their strategy up until when we you know did this piece with them was to focus on like the long tail like the like let's write content that like only an engineer who knows uh, what a mesh network is and like how it performs and all this stuff, like that's what we're going to write. And there's only going to be 10 people who search on that a month, but those 10 people, if we can get in front of them, those are good people. It's not a bad strategy, but we felt like they needed more stuff kind of in the higher funnel. Um, and so we helped them develop a, an educational blog, kind of like that evergreen piece that I talked about with, the college and university, it was like, how can we, how can we help you um, win? And so, yeah, like the, the great thing is if you can win on those terms, you're going to save a lot of money on like the paid media side. So, you know, what they were doing was they were paying the, for the P PPC clicks on those. And so what we calculated was, it was like a, $15,000 a month or something and cost savings because we were able to get this piece that was a little bit higher funnel to outrank some of those very competitive, like those big competitors so that they didn't have to pay for the clicks. So anyway, that's like an example of that kind of work. I love it. That's such a cool niche business, but big. Um, yeah. First of all, uh, Josh, I want to thank you. I have one last question before I ask sure. it. I want to point people to your website and they can go to augurian.com, A-U-G-U-R-I-A-N. And I know you, we mentioned Simon Sinek before, and I'd love for you to talk about what other resources, whether it's leadership or any other books or uh, audio books that you recommend to yourself and your team. Yeah, sure. So, um, we are a uh, EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System uh, shop. So we have embraced EOS. So if you haven't heard of EOS, uh, Gino Wickman, the author of a book called Traction, is where you're going to find most of that information. Um, I think it's really great from like an operational side of things. Um, there's a, a guy by the name of Patrick Lencioni, who's written a book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. So that's more on like the relational side of things and like what you need uh, from a team, from a relational side to get results. Whereas EOS is more like operational in nature. Uh, those two are great. You know, start with why the Simon Sinek book is a good one. I also like his book called Eaters, uh, Leaders Eat Last. Um, that is a great book. And the, that premise comes from interviews that he did with like Navy SEALs. And, um, you know, their, the ethos that they have is like the leader of the SEAL team that always eats last. Um, anyway, good stuff. I'm, I've enjoyed those types of books. Um, and my the most recent book I read um, was called Leadership Self-Deception. And I don't have the off, author off the top of my head. Uh, actually, I think it's like a think tank that authored the book. Um, but that was really uh, interesting. And it's like told in a story form. It's like a narrative. So it's not like a typical leadership book. So that's a good one too. First of all, Josh, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out more episodes of the podcast. Check out agreeing.com and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Josh. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.